thanks very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, the university recognised me. They sent me a very nice letter and said I could have either a bottle of wine or a bottle of olive oil. My ch <laughs> my ch I couldn't have both. My children said, take the olive oil, it'll last longer. <laughs> now, I know, I know my talk is actually too long, so there's parts of it I'm going to have to skip over, providing I know how to press the buttons. Now, I called my talk Why Strategic Design Makes Place, but having thought about it a bit more and having gone back and looked at some of the things that have happened at Piermont, what I do think is str strategic design is absolutely essential in trying to get the structure of the city right. And then after that, all kinds of things can happen. A classic example of that is actually Trafalgar Square, because it went along Premier Square, Heritage One in, in the UK, but it never actually worked for anything other than a few pigeons on the southeast corner. So an intervention went into Trafalgar Square at, I think, about $40 million, and now it works very well. So not all places work, but the thing about it is that the space was there, it was in the right place, but over time it needed some kind of intervention, and that would happen to many, many spaces. Now, very quickly, um, I'll talk about um, strategic design, the key components, and some case studies. And I did want to hopefully touch on SEP65 if I have time. Now, my background, for anybody that doesn't know me, um, I'm actually a crossed-over architect. And I crossed over very early in my career. Um, I went to Europe and I somehow ended up in Siena and I wandered around and I went into the Campo in Siena and tears came to my eyes and I thought, Everything I learned in architecture was wrong. Now that wasn't entirely true, or everything I learned at university was wrong. It wasn't entirely true because they did tell me that I was going to learn to think, and some of us did and some of us didn't. <laughs> so I was actually trained, I was actually trained to be a Mrs. Cabousier, not a Mr. Cabousier. His objects would be bigger than mine, but nevertheless that was the, the modernist manner of my training. The other thing that happened very early in my career were these little buildings here. Came to me when I was in the Department of Planning. There was a plan that you probably don't realise was afoot at the time to knock them down to put a three-storey building with a McDonald's on the top, hard on the edge of Circular Quay. You couldn't even walk past it on the water side. Anyway, Department of Planning were absolutely no help. MSB put it in, government thing, just pass it, Jan. Wrote to the mayor, even though I was working for Department of Planning. I don't think you could do that now. Um, eventually, the, um, I convinced the Maritime Services Board, a guy called Charles Jones, to withdraw the application. That gave me an entirely inflated view of what I could achieve in my life. <laughs> now, Space and land are the, are the best friends of, of city makers. It's, I'm la going to labour the point about how important street patterns are and land is and how we need to understand the role of space in a city. Because a city is about tension. That boat, that ship, looks amazing in the harbour. Just gets under the bridge. There is a tension. That's why it looks so much more dramatic in our harbour than a place like Auckland Harbour. The other thing about land, land is totally, absolutely unique. And I would agree with the lady who said before, why after 30 years are we still not understanding and acknowledging what land actually means within our cities? I pick up any DCP across New South Wales, and if I hadn't been here, I'd be absolutely certain it was dead flat. Occasionally, there's might something, or if there's a bit of a slope, you can step it differently. So I think not understanding the uniqueness of land and the intrinsic relationship between people and land is um, absolutely fundamental. When we talk about placemaking, I get a bit nervous because it's sort of <coughs> jargon. I think, well, you know, it's, cities have always been about place. The Romans, you know, camped there for three years before they made a city and put up a windsock and. It's always been about making place, but I think that relationship between people and land is the thing that post Second World War is the thing that has been missing. So what I would like to talk about, conventionally place has been described as plaza and plazas and courtyards, etc. Place only exists with paths. So the street system are absolutely fundamental to how a place works. It's why 
um, Barangaroo won't work, it's why um, Docklands doesn't work and it's why the new thing on, on Perth waterfront won't work as well. Streets are the lifeblood and understanding how they work relative to land is fundamental in, an, in creating place. Nasty things can happen to those streets, I know, but if they're there at least we can try and protect them. So my philosophical basis is basically towns are three-dimensional contextual entities. And all the interventions should be designed and drawn. Now, I don't mean that in that the community can go out and do whatever they want to do in their spaces, whether it's Trafalgar Square or whether it's swings in a park or whatever, and that will always change over time. The last time I went to Rome, nobody was killing Christians in the Piazza Navona. So, you know, it had a market, it's now a marketplace, it's now something they have a special thing at Easter and whatever. So spaces are always going to change over time. So what is essential? I think one of the, why is strategic design essential? It's essential because we need to understand the city as a, as a collective. It's a collective of land space and buildings, not just a collection of objects. Our planning system tends to focus on objects. DAs, you go through all this agony with individual buildings, look at Milson's point, look at the collective, it is a mess. So it's also the hard the nature, the hard physical nature of cities. When the street systems are in, you can't change them. They're the things that do not change or they're extraordinarily expensive to change. So it's so important that we actually get those things right. And I would argue that in a lot of our post-World War II um, developments, we are not getting that hard infrastructure right. Strategic design is rarely used, I've said Australia, but I think that that's fairly confident. And funny enough, I do think the people in, in Brisbane have done a lot better than a lot of other countries. And why do I say funnily enough? Um, it's probably not <coughs> what one expects in, in Queensland. But I do think that, um, you know, you think they're all out there on the beaches, not sort of worrying about it, but I do think that their approach to the South Bank in Queensland has been far more successful for people than, than many of the areas in, in the other states. But our planning system is based on zoning, it's not based on design, and it doesn't consider land or space, and it considers the city as a collection of objects. I think there is a real confusion between real estate and city making, um, and we don't monitor. We don't monitor anything. We just keep rolling out these things. We roll out buildings that must have X amount of community, communal space, whether they work or they don't work. Now, other professions monitor. If I'm a doctor and I perform an operation and I go back and nine out of 10 patients die, something in my head says, I better think about that operation. We don't do it with planning. We just keep building more. You know, why would, after Docklands in Melbourne, of all places, the other reason for the opposite of the Queensland, why would they build it in Perth? There are fundamental reasons why we know those kind of places don't actually work. The other thing is poor implementation, what happens over time, and we have a drawing illiterate culture. Now, don't be too offended because maybe lots of people here can understand drawings. Heaps of people cannot understand drawings. I had a PA once, I put a little drawing out, I said, Deb, will you fax that off for me? And she said, you mean that page of, of um, Chinese hieroglyphics? I said, can you not understand that page of Chinese hieroglyphics? That is a very important thing to remember every time you're talking to councillors or CEOs of councils. I had one that used to push the drawings away every time I spoke to him. It's why councillors will rely on artist perspectives that are usually to totally incorrect and underscaled anyway, but that's how they get away with it. Now, how does design apply to urban areas? I'm really just going to talk about city design and precinct design. Any design, I would argue, is actually multidisciplinary. It's just that urban design tends to be uh, different people, different scales, and it is more overlapping than if you're designing a chair or a, a car. But it, they're all, all design is multi, multidisciplinary. Now, key components, land, space, and built form. Space is the primary organising element of urban morphology. He's my hero, Bernard Hewitt. 
And that is why many of the interventions into our cities haven't actually worked, because they're not understanding space as the connector, space as the integrator, not buildings. Forget buildings, they're nice. They're nice, but the buildings, you need to think about buildings as putty that define space. And then you'll think about that city, the city very differently. Okay, lands, every, when I talk about land, I mean everything. I mean the shape, the, the water, the rivers, the edges, the what's under the ground affects what's out of the ground. Space, three-dimensional system created by the street pattern and the placement and organisation of the built form relative to the land. Very important to understand human beings see in a view corridor 70 degrees and they are this so close to the land. So what can look absolutely identical in plan when you're actually in the land, on the land, you may not, see. in one street you will see, in another street you won't. So the spatial, and the space is a system. I like this little quote from Louis Armstrong, the spaces between the notes are as important as the notes. So if I can hopefully get some people to walk out here tonight and, or today and think about, start thinking about the city as a series of spaces. Now I spoke to one of my architect colleagues the other day who's a good architect and I said, we need a modest building. Oh, he said, I don't like that. I don't like <laughs> modest building. <laughs> modest is boring. No, modest is not boring. Not boring at all. Just look at all the cities that have got heaps and heaps of modest buildings, but a wonderful spatial system. So why is the spatial system so important? That last point is the, is the thing that really determines it. The spatial system is the major determinant of legibility, identity, variety, accessibility, amenity, economics and safety, not the buildings. Space is the long-term framework of the city. It's what, it doesn't change. Not the short, the buildings are the short term. So it's very important not to put all your, all your money or all your eggs into your built form, as much as I love nice buildings. Okay, so here we are, here's the buildings, here's the putty. Now it's interesting, things like bridges and expressways really actually go into both the spatial system and into the built form. So it's quite interesting how they can either connect or they can divide. So what we need are outcomes that reinforce place. So we need a, sp a street system and a spatial system you need to use relatively straight streets. They need to be extensive streets. One of the problems in, I think, modern cities in terms of people and our legibility and how we use them and how we adapt them is that we're designing all these little pods, these tiny little pods, and then there's a gap and then there's another little pod. If you look at all the robust cities in the world and how they adapt and how they come together, they are really extensive. You look at the street systems in the cities that work very well, they are extensive. Burke Street here goes for miles. Now, a couple of places they've cut it off, which was pretty, pretty stupid, but no doubt it's still there and over time they might open it up again. Crown Street, the street systems of Surrey Hills, all the peninsula systems in Sydney, the street systems, really good, really reveal the land. And because they reveal the land, you have a strong sense of identity before you put one single solitary building in those places. So that's the kind of street system and integrated system that we need. My point about the strategic design is that if that structure is not sound, no amount of tweaking will fix it. They said of Docklands in Melbourne that it was structurally unsound, and that is, that is the problem. So it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it, or public art, or whatever, because it is so disconnected from Melbourne, which was the perfect example. It just had to extend those streets down. Brilliant. Um, so the spatial system, it, having said that, that even if it, if it is not flawed, there are ways you can stuff it up, and I will show you those in Piermont. So very quickly, I'm going to dive across the Tasman. Does anybody know Wellington? Okay, 
this is how I think fundamentally our design work should should be carried out. Now there'll be different stages and different things will apply. But always are you, you start from the big and you work to the site. Most of our stuff starts at the site. I've had DAs come in to me in council and various places in my working career. The only way I knew where the street was was because there was an entrance to the car park. There was no sense that you're actually putting this building, you're building a little piece of a cake. There's the cake, you're only putting a little piece in. So you, to understand the city, you need the big picture. Now in Wellington, here's beautiful Wellington. They have 57 good days a year. These photos were taken on good days. They have, um, uh, it's the only dense urban city in Australasia, which is important, capital of New Zealand, and it is the um, same size, roughly, in population as Canberra. It's also interesting that it is one of the few cities where more people come into it on weekends than work in it during the week. So, very fine grain block system in one area, and it's got, I know everybody says, well, it's got the mountains around it, that's why it's, why it's actually quite dense. In actual fact, Wellington Council, about 15 or more years ago, made a concerted decision not to go up the Hutt Valley, that they would actually concentrate the city. So councils can make a difference. Now, um, okay, again, starting with the big, looking at the history, looking at what's under the, under the ground, etc. Going through that whole process of understanding a place. And this is a view looking back down towards the CBD. Now, until, until we did this work, even though I'd lived there, you can't understand the city until you draw it. You've, you actually, I don't care, you see all the DCPs, we would have the most five and 24 hour a day wonderful city in the world if you just read the fronts of DCPs. In actual fact, <laughs> it's because they don't understand, because those documents are all about words, they're not saying, well, what is this place like and how do we make this place like the words we want? Now, four things from Wellington we learnt from doing this strategic work. One of the things was, do I have a, is there a pointer? Okay, <coughs> very, very fine grain, very, very fine grain in here. Um, Wellington has had a few major earthquakes and last time I think the land changed about um, 12 metres, it went higher than the sea. Now, I think they're counting on that with sea level rise that they'll have another earthquake, but it's a fairly <coughs> tenuous way of, of dealing with, with um, global warming. Now, this area in here was n had been kind of low grade, um, you know, car, sales room, two story things, two story buildings. But in here, the, we needed to make it denser and to put in more residential. So the blocks were clearly too big there. So by understanding this work, we were able to look at what the ownership patterns were, what, what was the feasibility of putting streets through, where there were laneways that existed that might be able to extend it, and then from that, we were able to look at what might be the building controls that would facilitate that happen, happening. Putting just a blanket zone over that and giving it three to one and saying whatever, dead, apart from being dead boring, and um, we would never be able to achieve either open space or the connections that needed to go into these very big blocks. Rule of thumb, Portland blocks are 80 by 80. That's about the finest you'd ever go in an urban area. It's also the same sort of thing we were trying to do at Macquarie Park with enormous resistance from anybody that owned land. So, but by doing that, we were then able to start to look at what kind of building forms went in there, what were the important intersections, what weren't the important intersections, because there's a huge difference. Corners are very different things in different places, on different streets. Second thing we looked at was this. In most of that area, all the streets were orthogonal, except this little guy, Victoria Road. Now, that had happened with earthquake and whatever. When we did this work, we discovered it had been a major water course. When I first went there and I stood on this corner and, and somebody said to me, well, Jan, what sort of planting and seating do we put here? And I thought, I don't know. I haven't got a clue. I don't know anything about this place. The moment we did this work, we started to work out what had happened, 
where it had come from, where the buildings should be aligned, should they be angled, should they be orthogonal, how should this public domain then be treated. Until we did that work, we actually had no idea about that street. The third place we looked at, or the third example I'm giving you, is the um, Houses of Parliament, the Beehive, which sits in a kind of sea of trees and very ugly buildings. Now, everybody was talking about, oh, let's, let's knock down the buildings, let's knock down the archive building. You can't do it, it's an ugly building. The problem wasn't the archive building. The problem was what had happened to the land and the traffic. So in this case, the next intervention was about land form and not built form and what you could do with that. So out of this strategic design work started to drop smaller projects that would knit the city together. Wellington has two universities in the city and they use the city for their graduation, throwing up their hats and everything. So it's really very well integrated in that way. The last point is the port. Now, they're convinced that out here, um, here's the, the stadium here. Um, the port people convinced they're always going to have a port there, and maybe they will. But at the present time, they were doing master plans on the edge here, on the edge here, that fundamentally meant that if the port ever became anything else, which it may well do considering the number of ports in New Zealand and considering the condition of the timber industry, there was all kinds of opportunities that were actually going to be cut off just simply by the master planning and the failure to integrate the street system as it, as it needed to be integrated so that in the future something else could happen if it needed to. So they were the four and then we got into the detailed design. But they were the four key things that came out of that strategic design. The street pattern, the building form, the public domain direction and the changes to the land form and stopping what might be a blocker. I always say these cities have got blockers, major blockers. Um, might be a blocker to, to a future really integrated waterfront area. Now I'm going to touch on Piermont. How many people are going on the Piermont walk? Okay. Well, I'll whiz through this. We know where Pier here's Piermont, CBD, uh, White Bay, Balmain over here. Now, we're just in there, yes. And we're very near the cage that hangs off this expressway that takes pedestrians from this end of Ultimo to the city. I don't know if you've, if you've actually seen that, but it's a very interesting piece of infrastructure. The bridge, I should talk about the bridge. Daryl Conybear, I think he was the last person that saved it. Went to, got in the ear of the Premier that on Sunday night the demolition contract was going to be let the next morning, convinced the Premier it could be the Ponte Vecchio. I don't care what he convinced him. What was amazing is that that bridge is the absolute lifeblood into Piermont. And it was so close to being getting the chop. So that was one good thing. We kept the bridge. This work was done. I joined City West Development Corporation. It was Better Cities money. It was, and um, Brian Howe had, was probably our last politician that was particularly interested in cities and um, was very keen to promote really people oriented, good urban environments. There are a lot of um, organisations involved Commonwealth money, City West Development Corporation, City of Sydney, etc. Um, Jackson's Landing was a Lend-Lease site. That wasn't part of City West Development Corporation. Regional, the original Environmental Plan 26 set a whole bunch of things in place. The reason I mention this is that it's the wrong scale to set as much detail in place as they did. Because every time when we then went to look at it in greater detail, <coughs> if we wanted to make a park, 10 square metres smaller and put it somewhere else, you had this enormous um, planning process to go through. So I think it's Im very important to look at doing the, more di doing the general stuff up here in the, the big scale plans, and it's particularly relevant now with the white paper, then to start looking at more detail, feed that back into the, into the major plans if that's the way it needs to be done in terms of legislation. 
but otherwise there were too many things. It was, it was extremely difficult to change anything and those decisions were really made without the detailed design work. Well, one of the things we did was um, we did context. This was new. I mean, this is 1995. So this is, this is really new. When I joined City West Development Corporation, they had to get an urban designer. <gasps> yawn, yawn. And somebody said they had to have a woman. More yawns. It was really good they could get all in one and they didn't have to employ two of us. Um, but the, th the there was there was this is the premier design project probably under better cities in Australia. There was not a plan of Piermont Point. There was not a drawing. All the City West Development Corporation at that time had were a series of surveys of the sites they owned. I said, well, we need a drawing of the whole of Piermont. We need the drawing of Piermont in the context. They said, why, Jan? We don't own all of Piermont. But it is so symptomatic because it could have been developed that way. It could have been developed just by selling those sites. They had their zoning, they had their height, and off they went. So it was a bit of a battle, you know, particularly things like trying to get a real understanding of context within the city. Okay, now the process we used was block studies that then fed back into a final master plan. Now things on that changed later on and I will show you those, but that's the process that we used. We did get all the information on every heritage building that was there and we, we drew it up. You couldn't get it by Google, it was actually quite hard to do. City, uh, City Council were very good in giving us their um, drawings. But Everything was drawn absolutely accurately. And this is what I mean. It is so important to understand really what you're dealing with in a city. What are the changes of level? How high is the heritage building, etc., etc. So we did block studies. We're running out of time. I won't go through the... This is the kind of work we did, though. Master planning, blah, 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 block studies. And there is a whole do document, if anybody's interested, we can do that. Can I say that if you put in new streets, like we did here, and then you do terrible things at either ends of them, then they won't, like, won't work like new, new streets. There's seven tram stops in Piermont. Only six, um, six of them you can't um, find where they are. Not good for light rail. Okay, I will go quickly to, I forget the view corridor, I forget the, ex a building, we put in a building where there was going to be a slab of open space, not good, it needed a building, that's for John. Um, but then we created a space, read a cliff, and they came along I discovered recently and stuffed it up by putting a building in there. Um, very, this was very important and I will show you when we go on the walk, creating a view corridor, extending the street and creating a view corridor across to the, across, here it is, across to the city. But then it was made mean, developer wanted more, so this, instead of the stairs being the full words, we get that. Meanness is very, very nasty in a public domain. I don't care what they do on those stairs, but they should have been generous, they should have been full width. Then you've got the opportunity, you can come and you can have markets on the double street or do whatever you want to do. The last one I will just mention is a private, because this is so important in Sydney, privatisation of public parks. So We're so good at it. The high income group in our city are so good. We had a road here, a public road, and we wanted stairs down through Gibber Park. Gibber Park is hardly ever, ever used. It has been totally privatised. I was no sooner out the door from City West Corporation than that public road was gone. And mm -hmm. um, it doesn't whether it's McMahon's point, Ballast point, there are very, very subtle ways of saying keep out everybody. And we, that's something that we really have to watch. So I won't go there. I'll forget all those. Oh, we shouldn't have lost these. These were tourist dollars. This was serious money about people staying in Piermont, staying in Sydney for another day. That's the same, that turbine hall was exactly the same as Tate Modern in London, exactly. So now we spend two and a half thousand dollars on a cheap ticket to get to London to go to Tate Modern. Now, we, even if we put the casino in it, we w should have kept the space. This finest building technically and architecturally of its kind in the world, finest. 
absolutely finest. So we bulldoze and we put up Meriton Apartments. Not a big, not a big tourist destination. This should never have been light rail, freight rail. It should have been a part. We had, it could have been the low line. New York does it, so we get on a plane there and we go and say, oh, they made a rail apart. This was the most extraordinary space. It does not work for light rail, and it was absolute, would have been the most brilliant urban park. So I'm going to forget all those things. I always over cater. Um, <laughs> Can I just say something? Because we've got RMS here. We've got our very important work we did at Auburn. Oh, wrap it up. <laughs> Western. <laughs> <laughs> Western distributor. We did an exercise on that. It went down when the street, when the land went down, and it went up when the land went up. Had it done the opposite, you could have connected this wonderful street pattern that's sitting back in here all the way through to the water and Olympic Park, and Olympic Park wouldn't be sitting there like a dead elephant. So I'm going to, I'll just give you my final. Forget SIP 65. First thing, context. It hasn't happened. Everybody's just latched onto all the ridiculous numbers and not done anything about context. Lack of imagination is the greatest evil, and I hope in this short overrun time I've convinced you that strategic design is essential.